so this is the first week for this because we had a first Wednesday last week. And so we're starting the series, it's called Better Together. And so this is really uh, about community. And so uh, the message I'm gonna be talking to you guys about from tonight is um, it's just Christ changes community. Christ changes community. And um, I'll be really honest with you. I had a lot of notes together, like a lot of stuff. One of the guys told me that I had like 41 slides of stuff together. And uh, before I came in, I feel like, uh, man, like I'm gonna be be really honest with you. I felt like I had to just not do that. And and I'm still teaching on the same subject, the same topic. I'm just gonna talk about something really specific uh, or like one little kind of pinpoint of it, but I, I honestly felt probably more than I've ever felt in my life teaching, which I've been working here for, like I said, going on 12 years, had my opportunity to do this, probably more than ever before that God wanted to say something specific tonight and I needed to change it. So we took like 41 pages of notes down, or pages, like slides down to like nine, you know, or like six or something. And so we're going to get really concise here, but the reason why is because I believe like so strongly that God wants to speak something to somebody. And it might be one, literally one person. And I feel like God changed the whole night so that you could hear uh, this idea about um, Christ and community and how our lives as we follow Christ changes the way that we interact with and see the people around us, okay? And so that's what we're gonna be talking about. And, um, And I think it was so fitting that we sang All Hail King Jesus because... Um, The reason that we're gathered together on a Wednesday night at Faith Family Church at the U is because of Jesus. And uh, the truth is like, we love to have a good time. And I love that we love to have a good time. And like, Lexi was up here singing notes. I didn't even know she could hit, you know what I mean? She's up here. I was like, how are we even singing in this key? Like I sing, I don't sing in that key. You know what I'm saying? Like we get together, we sing, we sing songs, we dance. I love seeing the people up here jumping and dancing and having a good time while they worship. Cause come on, we can have a good time while we worship. Um, I like that we've got haze machines. I can hardly see you. You know what I mean? Uh, so I don't get as nervous. Just kidding. Um, I go home. I have to use my inhaler. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Um, but I love that we have a good time. I love that we can laugh in church, that we can enjoy ourselves. But like, make no mistake, the reason that we're here is because we follow Jesus. The reason that we're here is because, uh, so this is the story of Christianity, right? Um, that God created the earth. He created man in his image. Man rebelled and turned away from God. And because of that, there was, a, there was distance created, right? You could look at it this way, like an atomic bomb called uh, a nuclear bomb called sin dropped on the world that good, the good world that God created. And ever since then, we've been living in the fallout of that nuclear bomb, right? Well, Christ came to close that gap, to clear up the fallout so that we could come back into right relationship with Jesus. And that's the thing that has brought us all together, that our lives were under the fallout, under the nuclear fallout, under the, the sickness and the shriveling and the brokenness and the decay of sin sin. And God entered our life through Christ, the grace of Christ. And because of that, our lives have changed. Okay. That's the thing that brings us all together. When you talk about community, communities gather together um, based on something, right? Uh, Whether that's an internal thing, whether that's an external thing, whether that's ethnicity, whether it's political belief, whether it's uh, like moral beliefs, right? Uh, whether it's what side of the tracks we grew up on, wh- whatever it is, like communities gather together for reasons. And you can observe this all around us in the world, like right now, right? What are all the different debates that are going on? All the hot topic issues, hot button issues that you see online, people debating, all that stuff. What are those? Those are people who have gathered together because of some moral stance or some belief that they have. And they're like yelling and pointing their fingers at the person who's on the other side, right? What is that? Those are two different communities that have come together based around something and they don't mesh, right? right? Well, the thing, the one thing that has brought our community together is Christ, right? Um, And what I love about that is it's because uh, when you look at the Christian community, what do you see? You see people from different political backgrounds. You see people from different ethnic backgrounds. You see people who uh, they're battling through uh, different types of moral beliefs. What does the Bible say about this? What is God leading me in this? Why? Because the thing that unites us isn't any of those things, but it's only Christ. And then through Christ, we filter all of those other things. Okay. Does that make sense? This is really important because um, everything that we're going to talk about tonight is about how Christ affects our relationships. But if you don't have the right relationship with Christ, you're not going to have the right, right relationship with other people. And this is what, this is what I believe God put on my heart so strong. Like I promise you, I was almost crying and I don't even, I don't even do that. 
I'm a, I'm a man. You know what I mean? No, um, I'm just joking. It's okay to cry, guys. Um, but but in, in like all reality, like I was I was praying. Like I had I had my notes ready to go. I'm ready to go. And I'm like I, I told my wife I was like, Hey, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna go pick up some canes and some lemonade and go to the church and get ready. And like I'm on the way and I'm just praying in my car. And like guys, I couldn't shake it. Like I couldn't shake it. And um and I was like, man, I I can't even like eat right now. I gotta skip. I gotta skip the cane sauce and the lemonade, right? And go straight to the church. I know it's sad, right? Sacrifice for the Lord. Uh, just kidding. And I got here and I just kept praying. And I kept praying and I texted my connect group. Side note, tonight is signups for connect groups. So as we talk about community, like get yourself in a connect group um, because we're there for each other. That's what connect groups are. We learn and we grow together. So, so no lie, I, te- I didn't even uh, remember that when this happened, but I texted my connect group. I was like, guys, I need you to all pray for me because I just feel like something, like I feel something. And, um, and so I know my connect group guys were praying for me and I'm praying. And this is what I felt like God dropped in my heart. I felt like God said, uh, there are people, there's gonna be someone there tonight who they can't experience love in their relationships with others because they haven't experienced love in their relationship with me. God, I'm like, I'm like almost crying right now. And I don't do that. I'm not Kyle, all right? Like I don't do this. All right. Um, we can't love others correctly, properly, healthily, and we can't be loved by others until we understand that God loves us, right? We will always see the shortcomings that we have, the failures that we have, uh, all the places that, that we don't measure up. And here's the thing, guys, gonna be a downer for just a second. We see them because they're there. We have shortcomings and we have failures. And we are acutely aware of all the places that we don't line up. Like nobody knows my faults more than me, right? Nobody knows the band-aids that I put on things to cover it up. Nobody knows, you know, the, the paint job that I put on myself to try to cover up all the cracks and the crevices and the places that don't line up better than me, right? And when you live in that knowledge, it's really hard to think that anybody else can love me because if I can't even love myself, how can somebody else love me? And that's what somebody in here is thinking. If I can't love myself, how can somebody else love me? But what God is trying to tell you through worship, like I didn't talk to the worship team about what I was gonna talk about. I didn't talk to Lexi about, I didn't say, hey, Lexi, can you exhort this way? Because I'm gonna talk about Jesus just a little bit in the you, you know? Like I didn't, But through all of this, God, like there's been a string that's been going through the night tonight. And what is it? Like what? All hail King Jesus, right? He came and he died for us. Why? Because he loves us, right? Uh, Let me find my scripture here. Romans 5.8 says this. It says, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what's that mean? That means that God saw all the broken stuff. He saw all the shortcomings. He saw all the failures. And before we ever did anything, before we acknowledged him, before we asked him to do anything for us, before we said, you know what, God, I'm gonna give my life to you. I'm gonna follow you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what does it say? It says, this proves his own love for us, right? So I believe what God wants us to know is that he loves us so much that he sent Christ for us, right? John 3, 16, right? And it's until we rest in that perfect love of God, we will never be able to experience healthy love in others, And part of the reason for that is because until we've experienced perfect love in God, we are trying to get others to fill a gap that they cannot possibly fill. I've been married for 13 years. My wife is awesome. She makes me better. I tell her that all the time and I mean it. I would be an idiot if it wasn't for her. Come on. Um... Can I tell you that my wife does not fill every part of my life? And I can't, I can't fill every part of her life. 
And if, my, if I made my wife God in my life, if I made her the thing with which I get all of my value, I get all of my love, uh, that I get all of my affirmation, that I, uh, I get my strength and my foundation, then the moment my wife fails me, whether, whether that's because she did something to fail me or whether that's because, come on, at some point, like, we going to die. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we don't live forever, you know? Like, if something could happen, like, not even her fault, right? And she could fail me in a way that's like she's not, like, things happen, right? Accidents happen. Things, like, relationships change. Things happen. Like, I don't believe me and my wife are going to have, like, a relationship change. We got, like, a divorce or anything like that. No, because we're committed to each other. But, but things can happen in life that if all my trust was in her alone, that could devastate me, Right? And what we do is we try to put all of the things that we need in the people around us, and then those people fail us, and then we're worse off than we were before. Where if our trust is in Christ, and we're resting in the perfect love of Christ— then we actually can get things from the people around us uh, because we do complement each other and we support each other. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but we're supposed to lift each other up. We're supposed to be there for each other. But the moment that somebody fails me, I'm not now crushed because why? Because they're not my God. And my God is perfect and he doesn't fail me and he never leaves me and he never forsakes me. And the other thing about it is that um, when we rest in Christ, it actually allows us to love other people better because we've experienced per- perfect love. So now I can give more perfect love, right? So um, I got a couple points I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say. I've kind of talked about them already, but I want to get them down so you can write them down, and then I'm just going to keep riffing for a minute. Is that Okay. So our relationship with Christ is the foundation for our relationship with others, okay? Until we understand God's love for us, we will not be able to love the people around us. And until we see that God loves the people around us as he loves us, we will not be walking in Christian community. Because when I understand that God came for me when I was broken— Well, now I'm able to put up with the brokenness in somebody else because that was me, right? And when I understand that God saw my sin, which my sin is against him, right? Like even if my sin's against somebody else, like my sin's against him because God is perfect. God is holy. God is righteous. Like God's love for us doesn't negate God's holiness, right? God's love for us doesn't negate his his command for righteousness, right? That's why Jesus had to come because we couldn't bridge that gap ourselves, right? So God sees that and he's not pleased with it, but he loved me anyways. And instead of leaving me to die in it, he sent salvation for me instead, right? And so when I see that God has seen the dirtiest, ugliest, most broken parts of me, then how can I look at my brother and say, no, because you're too dirty, you're too broken, you're too far from God. And I would go further to say that when we do look at our brothers and our sisters and we sit in the seat of the judge, it's because we don't have an accurate picture of God's love for us. It's because God forgives me over and over and over and over and over again that when somebody wrongs me, I must forgive them. Like I have to. That doesn't mean that you like, like I understand there are situations that you have to separate yourself from a situation. I'm not saying that you don't, right? Like abuse exists. Evil people exist. You have to separate yourself from those things. I'm not saying that you don't. But we also have a Christian responsibility to love and to forgive, right? And God can deal with their hearts. And, and like scripture says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, right? So we're not supposed to hold bitterness and hope for revenge. We let God do his thing. And we say, God, you forgave me despite my brokenness. So I'm going to forgive others. This is what Christian community looks like. This is what love for the, the world around us looks like. And I don't think I'm going to go too much longer today, honestly. It's going to be the shortest you message you guys ever heard 
right? James 5.16 says this, I love this. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. I love this because I think that it's a perfect example of a place in community that doesn't happen if Christ isn't the centerpiece. Because how can I confess my sins to you if I don't trust you? How can I open myself up with vulnerability if I think that God has it out for me? How can I hear forgiveness from you if I don't believe in forgiveness from God? Right? And so we have this this precedent that's set in scripture that we're actually supposed to have such a relationship with each other that we can confess our sins to each other. Like that I can come to you and tell you the things that I don't want you to know, right? And that you're going to respond in a way that's going to bring life and not death. Well, that, if I'm the person that's being confessed to, the only way I can sit in that seat and respond in a healthy way is if I understand that I've been that place before and that God has forgiven me, right? And I can tell you, like, I've been in that place before and God has forgiven me. And I've had conversations with leaders. Um, and I mean, like, as an adult, you know what I mean? Like, not like I was a 13-year-old and I'm like, oh, my God, I, I just found out what you can search on Google. <laughs> right? I'm talking about, like, I have, I've made mistakes. I have, I have sinned and I have gone to my leaders, like, and been afraid, right? Because, like, you hope people are going to respond graciously, but you also know what you deserve. And, it's kind of, and I've been like, okay, God, you're God and I trust you and I deserve whatever comes my way. So I'm going to go ahead and go to my leaders and I'm going to confess my sins. And I've been there and I've received grace from leaders that I didn't deserve and that I didn't expect because those leaders have received grace from God that they didn't deserve and they didn't respect. And now, years later, I'm in a place where I'm leading people spiritually, right? I'm, our camp, I'm a campus director. I'm sit, I sit with people who are going through divorces. I sit with people who are dealing with depression, dealing with, like, dealing with depression. That's not like a thing that you did wrong. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm dealing with people who are in broken situations that I'm able to sit and have candid conversations with them and be a picture of the grace of God to them because I've been in that place and received that grace, right? So when you live in in a place where you are walking in the truth of God's love for you, you can be the person who, who reveals God's love to others. Does that make sense? I love this. Um, there's a, a scripture, another scripture, James 5, 19 to 20. It says, my brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from error of his ways will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And I love this because it's like the reality that like people mess up. But it's the reality that like our place as Christians isn't in the place of a judge. Uh, It's in the place of a brother or a sister. But at the same time, we do have a responsibility to help them turn back, right? So what this means is is, is I can sit in a place of grace where I remind you of God's love for you. I remind you that God is there for you. And I also remind you of the truth that God has a standard for which you're supposed to live or for which that was the wrong way to say that, but you got me. And the thing that I love about this, because so, so sometimes I'll just tell you, this is just a thing about Chris Keys, right? So that's my last name, Keys. This is the thing about Chris Keys is that sometimes, you know, I can be like the guy who's like, um, like, man, we got to talk about, like, you can't just always talk about, like, the grace side. You got to talk about the truth side too, right? Because, like, they're both, they're both true. But, like, I get, I get weird about that sometimes. I'm like, come on, we got to know God, like, has a standard for us to live. Like, he does. And he has grace for us too. And when we, it's not until we understand the love that God has for us that I believe that we actually begin to live holy lives. Because it's not until we've experienced the love that God has for us that we are so in love with God that we actually desire to please him. 
Like there's only so long that I can live like legalistically. There's only so long that I can force myself to do something that I don't care about doing before I just go do the thing I really wanna do. But when I've experienced the God who loves me, who saw the broken me and stuck around long enough to heal me and to change me and to grow me, when that's the God that I serve, I wanna please that God. Like I wanna please him. I want him to be, I want him to be happy when he sees the things that I do. I don't want to disappoint God. Like we can disappoint God. I don't want to. I have before and he's forgiven me, thank God, in Christ, right? But so I believe that when we live in the truth, the revelation of God's love for us, that we can begin to live a holy life ourselves, that we can be pictures of grace to the people around us, that we can uh, speak truth in love to the people around us in a way that lifts them up and doesn't negate the fact that there needs to be a change. Like we can do all those things. There's a a quote that I'm going to read you real quick. I'm going to start wrapping things up here. Um, It's from uh, a book called Life Together. It's by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you guys might have heard of him. He's cool says this. Uh, the book is all about community, by the way. So if you're a reader, recommend it. It says this, therefore, the Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. He needs him again and again when he becomes uncertain and discouraged. For by himself, he cannot help himself without belying the truth. He needs his brother man as a hearer and proclaimer of the divine word of salvation. He needs his brother solely because of Jesus Christ. The Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain, but his brother's heart is sure. And I love this because it's just, it's pointing out like the scripture that we read, like confess to one another, right? Uh, And and the other scriptures talking about like um, turning one another back to Jesus, right? What's he saying? He's saying there are times that are going to happen in your life where you can't help yourself because you know the truth of what happened. You know the truth of the situation. You can't escape the facts. Like the facts are there. And if if we're honest, maybe that's where some of us are right now. We for sure have been there before. We'll probably be there again in the future. Like we, the situation is black and white to us. It's right there. The facts are there. I can't get away from it. God, why is this still happening? Where are you? I've been praying. Are you gonna move or not? Is the word true or not? And this is saying we need each other because when Christ in me which, right, this isn't saying that Christ himself, but this is saying my picture of Christ. When my picture of Christ is weak, when my picture of Christ is uncertain, when I'm not sure if he's there, that it's when my brother comes to me and reminds me, no, 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 this is what the word says. He'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. He loves you, he's strong, he's listening to you. He's moving even when you can't see it. He gave his son for you so that you could have right relationship with him. And when I can't see those things for myself, I need the person beside me to remind me, this is the God I serve. When the enemy is whispering in my ear, no, 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 he's not there. You're his son, you're his child. After that, after you said that, after you did that, you're questioning again. Come on, you think God's gonna be there for that? Where's your faith? You can't have that if you don't have faith. Come on, on, where's God at now? Look at all the things that are happening. I need the person beside me to remind me, no, 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 that's the enemy. Let me tell you what the voice of God sounds like. And here's the truth. Like, we need that for ourselves and God has ordained you to be that in somebody else. Like you you don't have the friends that you have on accident. You don't have the family that you have on accident. You don't have the job that you have around the people that you have. God has put you in spheres of influence so that he can use your voice and your testimony and your life to bring other people into relationship with Jesus. Because just like until you 
rest in God's love for you. You won't experience the, the fullness of relationships with other people. There are other people who are living in brokenness and shallow relationships that they're searching for things that they're not gonna find because God isn't the center, right? And they're filling up their lives with things that are only gonna leave them emptier than before. And you're there so that you can point them in the right direction. So you can say, no, 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 let me tell you what real love sounds like. Let me show you what real love looks like. So you can be the person that when they feel broken down, you lift them up. When the enemy's whispering lies in their ear, you're the voice of God that they need to hear right? We get to be the picture, the image, the reflection of Christ in the lives of the people around us. Well, hey, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. And I just want to take a moment and give those of you who have never made a decision to follow Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Maybe through listening to the message, you just sensed that God was tugging on your heart and you didn't really know what that meant, but maybe this was the moment that you're being prepared for Maybe you're watching and you've never accepted Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. You've never confessed him as your king. You've, you've never put your trust in the finished work of Jesus. Or maybe you're watching right now and you have before in the past, but since then you've, you've walked away from God. And I'm not talking about you just made a couple mistakes or you lied to your girlfriend or whatever. I'm saying for those of you who have followed Jesus and have stopped believing in him, if you want to recommit your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Because the Bible makes it super clear in, in John 14, verse 6, that Jesus, he is the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, no one can come to the Father. No one can be guaranteed life in heaven whenever we die unless they simply confess that Jesus is Lord. It doesn't come through good actions or good deeds. I can't do enough good things to earn more of God's approval or enough bad things to, to disearn his approval. All I need to do is put my trust in what Jesus did because none of us are perfect. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, but thank God that he sent Jesus to be the atonement for our sin. And now all I have to do is confess him as my Lord and receive salvation and be guaranteed, guaranteed life with God in eternity forever. So if that's you and you wanna make that decision for the first time, or you wanna recommit your life to Jesus, you wanna get some things right with God, I wanna encourage you to pray the simple prayer after me. Romans 10, nine through 10 says that all we have to do is confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord and we can be saved. So if that's you on either of those two invitations, I just want you to pray this prayer from your heart and from your mouth to God. You can close your eyes, bow your heads. Let's pray this prayer together. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I believe his finished work on the cross was more than enough to cover my sin, to cover my shame, and to cover my mistakes. I'm a new creation in Christ. In Jesus' name, everybody agree with it said, amen, amen. Well, hey, if you pray that prayer for the first time or you recommitted your life to Jesus, we wanna let you know, we're celebrating with you, we're rejoicing with you. It's the best decision you could have ever made, but we don't wanna leave you there in your journey. We really wanna come alongside you and help you discover some of your next steps in your journey with the Lord, because we know that just as important as the decision is to follow Jesus, equally as important is the decision after it to start pursuing your relationship with God. This is just the beginning of a brand new start for you. And we're celebrating with you in that decision, but we wanna help you discover some of those next steps. So if you could text the you to 94,000, and we would love to get in contact with you, help you discover some of your next steps in your journey with Jesus. But I thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We love you, we believe in you, and we will see you next time.